Proverbs 17, 22, a joyful heart is good medicine, but a crushed spirit dries up the bones. What is up, everybody? You're listening to another episode of Provoked. I'm Desi, and I'm here with my big brother, Zach. How are you today? I'm good. I'm well. That's great. How are you? I'm doing great. I'm. We're excited about this episode because we wanted to do something a little light and funny and sure. talk about the importance of being joyful because it's so easy right now to like turn on social media or the news and just be inundated by so much negativity and darkness that I think we need a good reminder of just the importance of having the joy of the Lord. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's altering when all you feed on is like negativity. Right. You know, that's just the only thing that's coming into your heart. It's just, it's not really fueling for the spirit. Right. It's, there's gotta be a balance. So like the scriptures say, Jesus was anointed with the oil of gladness. So mm-hmm. he's a man of joy, but also he was acquainted with sorrows. So he had this balanced life of being sorrowful over sin and just this, you know, the sinfulness of his creation, but also being joyful. Right. So I think you can capture those both in your life, you know? Right. And yeah, there's a, a time to be sober minded about the things of eternity. And um, of course, but there's also a, a time for rejoicing and basking in the joy of our salvation so this is that's what this episode is about and also i think like when we you go out and do the things that we do like going to the abortion mill a lot of our listeners do that Mm -hmm. doing public evangelism or even just dealing with your unsaved family and friends and coworkers, you know you can get really discouraged easily totally but i think you can have like life dominating joy that's what i've been kind of asking god about because we haven't talked to them talked about them in a long time but the scottish covenanters Mm -hmm. so i as i've been studying them and reading books and listening to a whole bunch of different sermons and you know um kind of conferences and classes i just love those guys so much but these are people who are being hunted down by the english dragoons right to be killed and the dragoons were the soldiers yeah they're the soldiers Mm -hmm. right english soldiers that of course were sent to to kill them Mm -hmm. i mean kill them and blow them up and kill them with knives. I mean, they, they just did whatever they could to hurt these people. But it says that they were men of hilarity. Oh. So even in the midst of like their friends dying, their kids dying, their mm-hmm. husbands dying, they've had this joy and they kind of, a lot of them laugh their way through it. Right. And I think that we got to have that spirit. It's like looking at things the right way say, you know, this is not our home. Right. You know? To live as Christ, to die is gain. That's right. I was, I can't remember who I was uh, listening to, but he says, it's better for us to die. Oh, it was Bonson. It's Greg Bonson. Mm-hmm. It was his last sermon because he actually preached his last sermon, no, thinking there was a higher prob- probability of his death wow. on Tuesday when he went into heart surgery. Mm. On Sunday, he preaches a sermon saying, hey, my doctors are saying it's a hi- highly likely that I'm not going to make through it, which he didn't. Wow. And he was able to preach his last sermon. If you haven't heard that, you got to go listen to it. It's amazing. Is that on Bonson U? Um, no, not yet, okay. but it's on YouTube. You could just look up Bonson's last sermon okay yeah that's awesome well that brings us to i need to talk about all access so do it if you haven't done it yet you guys you got to become all access members because you're going to be so blessed by the content and with all of bonson you just go get on apology studios.com go sign up now because what you do is you just you give back to the ministry but you also get so much from Mm -hmm. it you have so much content that you can um take in and be edified talk about like having light and good information at your fingertips instead of just being inundated by the negativity of the culture and the darkness this is going to really um just be an encouragement and a blessing to you and your family so if you haven't yet become an all access member um and also i just wanted to thank you for all to all of our um listeners that you know have kind of stuck it out with us we've been doing it for little over a year now and um, I'm just so encouraged by all of you guys thank you for your messages we get messages throughout the week and Mm -hmm. um, thank you for spending your time with us and um, yeah so hey a lot of people might not know this about you but you're kind of a foodie huh me yeah a little bit right well if you could look underneath the table (laughs) yeah you would be like yeah you're foodie (laughs) No, I mean, you You have, like, I mean, I know you, you like meat and potatoes type of guy, but you're also, like, you like sushi, you like, you know, I would say you have, do you think you're picky a little bit? No. You don't? I mean, well, you asked Pastor Jeff and Pastor Luke, because I just, like, sometimes I'll get, like, a Korean dish and uh-huh. not even know the meat. Uh-huh. Um, <laughs> I'm kind of like a meat guy, uh-huh. but I don't, I'm not too picky. No. about things i mean like i like my steak medium rare and that's mm-hmm. the only way i like i it, saw but. a post i think pastor callie had posted it the cow was still alive 
And oh yeah, that was pretty rare. But I'll eat that. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I'll definitely eat that. <laughs> like but super I'm... rare. Yeah, I mean, yeah. not too rare. You're just sitting there like chewing on this like blue piece of meat. Yeah. Like, <laughs> and then you're just wearing out your jaw. You're like, I should not be eating it this raw. Yeah. But, yeah, I like it pretty rare. I mean, I think when you cook it too well done, you're just cooking the goodness out of it. Yeah. You know, the juices out of it. But some people. Some people like it that way. Yeah, my husband. Yeah, I, know. I wasn't going <laughs> to point him out. But <laughs> Thankfully, your wife is an excellent cook, though. Yeah, she's got it. Yeah, she's she she really can't cook anything bad. It's like you are genetically disposed to either be a good cook or be a not so good one. Yeah, or like me, I had to learn. Like I've come a long way yeah. in my. <laughs> I finally learned that you can follow a recipe and. Most of the time oh, you'll totally. be, yeah. but no, your wife, she's just, yeah. She's one of those people like our grandma, like if she had the few ingredients in front of her, she could whip them up and it'll just taste amazing. Yeah. You like, know? She'll, I remember one time I took her out or I took her out to uh, our anniversary at uh, five year anniversary down in San Diego, mm -hmm. um, right there and down there in the Harbor. And we went to Ruth's Chris and I ate this, I think I've told you about this, but I ate the steak and, uh, you know, it was an expensive meal. I think it was 75, 80 bucks a mm -hmm. piece. And then I go home the next night, and for like twelve dollars, she makes this dish that was fifty times better. Wow! Yeah, that's incredible. Yeah, she's got it. And you, you hate tomatoes. Do you still hate tomatoes? Yeah, I mean, if they, you know, they'll sneak in in a taco or something like that. What but, do, you, um, do you? Can you taste it right away? Yeah, I can taste it. It's just like a texture thing. And maybe when I was a kid, I took that because it's so soft and. You know, the taste is gross, and it's just like an explosion of water. It's mainly water, <laughs> yeah. but it's just like, yeah, yeah, I just don't like it. I can't. I have a funny memory of you and tomatoes. So you've hated tomatoes for as long as I can remember. So when we were kids, that was like my life's goal was to get you to have a tomato. Yeah. So like when you weren't looking or something in the salad, we'd get salad at our, you know, on our dinner table, I'd like put tomatoes on the bottom and hope that you would like take a bite of it but you would just like get your fork and you'd see it right away or like <laughs> I remember one time you were like turned and I had a can of tomato paste and I was like close your eyes and <laughs> and, and I and I was almost got up to your nose and you're like open your eyes and they're like why would you do that and I was so mean too remember I'd be like oh yeah you're gonna make me eat a tomato I'll shave your head when you're sleeping <laughs> <laughs> you never did. So, but I would constantly be trying, but you would always catch me. So, one day, one of our neighbors came over. His name was Frank Pearl. Do you remember him? Yeah. And remember, he took us to Basket Robbins. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. I forgot about that. Mm -hmm. But uh, he had a little garden, and you were somewhere. Oh, no. That's a different guy. That was on uh, San Carlos. Oh, yeah. That was Joe something. Yeah. That, yeah. yeah. Um, no, Frank Pearl, he had a little garden, and he came over with a bunch of different vegetables and stuff. And one of them were these like heirloom tomatoes, and they were. When they were yellow and they or they they looked like little um light bulbs kind yeah. of yeah <laughs> kind of like pear shaped yeah like tiny pear shaped uh -huh. yeah. and uh he, I took a bite and it was really sweet and good and I was like what is this and he said it's oh it's actually a tomato and then immediately I was like this is my chance this is it <laughs> I'm gonna get him and so he left and then you walk in and I have the tomatoes and I'm like I'm like really trying not to sell it too hard because I'm like, man, he's gonna he's gonna figure it out if I do. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, hey, you gotta try these vegetables that Frank Pearl <laughs> brought over <laughs> because they're they're amazing. I, I don't even know what they are. They're just they're so good. And you're like, well, okay. And so I hand it the the yellow tomato to you, and you're looking at it. You can't tell it's a tomato. And my heart's like beating. I'm like, this is it. This is it. <laughs> and I you go to eat it. And you're like, ah, and right before you go in to put your mouth down, my conscience picks me. I'm like, don't do it. It's a tomato. <laughs> <laughs> and you were like, what is wrong with you? <laughs> so. And then I was probably like, hey, I'm glad I didn't eat that tomato because I would have killed you. Yeah. If I would have eaten it. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah. So anyways, this is a little fun fact about you. So, But you, I don't like tomatoes, but what do you, let me think what you don't like. When I was little, I was a freak and didn't like chocolate ice cream, but I like I, it now. I still don't like chocolate. But that was, remember Caleb and Nana, they loved Rocky Road mm -hmm. I, I don't really dig chocolate ice cream too much. I'll eat yeah. it, but I don't like order it usually. That's not my choice, but I can't think of like food. Like I, a particular food that you don't, you like Chinese food mm -hmm. and Mexican food. Mm-hmm. So you're the real foodie. Uh, yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I always think of foodies of people that are like more particular about what they want to eat. They want good quality food. Yeah. 
Yeah, See, that's true. Yeah, you yeah. like good quality food. I think it's because your wife is a great cook, and so your palate is probably more sophisticated. <laughs> where my poor husband will eat dirt meat. <laughs> well, yeah, uh, we are because I only yeah. like certain types of beef jerky. I'm a beef jerky guy. Yeah, and, yeah. So I would say, yeah, I'm I am kind of picky. I yeah. guess. Yeah. <laughs> Whatever. Yeah. Well, I mean, and as you get older, I feel like, it, like for me, anyways, you can't eat how you used to be able to eat. Like you used to be able to eat top ramen and you wouldn't get a stomach ache but now it's like you remember can't remember how, just... how good top ramen used to be oh my gosh but now it tastes so processed and like <laughs> pasty yeah and, uh, but they got re- actually got really good noodles at um costco um not to get far- too far off our subject <laughs> are but... they the thai the packet of thai yeah, yep those the... are i've gotten them they're good yeah, the spicy red one. Oh, i haven't gotten oh, you that. Gotta get that one yeah. it's pretty spicy but it's super good yeah well anyways okay so moving on to our topic so i wanted to kind of go through some current like news um there was a bill that was just passed sb 1457 and i know we're going to make this light but i wanted you to kind of explain about why this bill is bad um do you think that's something that you can do yeah i mean pastor jeff did a really good job Yeah, he did and he was on the news which and he did an excellent job explaining that yeah, exactly. But, but I, got, uh, I got a couple messages this morning saying, hey, good news. Look at this. Have you seen it? And I said, you know what? Um, yes, I did. It looked pretty promising. You know, uh, on the surface, it looks like a good thing, but it's actually a bad bill. And here's why. And so I kind of wrote a little brief description. Um, so what would you say? Um, yeah. Do you want to read the description first and I can go or do you want vice versa? Uh yeah, so the the bill's basically saying in it it's saying that you can't kill um you can't have an abortion because a child has down syndrome, right? Or has Yeah, if it has genetic abnormalities. abnormalities. Mm-hmm. So if you go for the purpose of hey, my child has down syndrome, then it's illegal to do that and then uh, abortionists can serve up to 3 years in prison for mm-hmm. doing that. Okay. Um but maybe you read what you said and I can actually I just want to kind of want to read what Jeff had written because he broke it down so well as to why it's not good. Of course, we have HB 2650 that we, you know, poured our life into to try to get that thing supported. We had Walt Blackman, who was the primary sponsor, the nine co-sponsors. And so what these guys have done, they didn't even hear HB 2650. So HB 2650 completely outlaws abortion, everything, abortifacients. And then, of course, because abortion is murder, if you murder someone, you do have to be penalized for it, just like we penalize people for murder now. Sure. Um, So it's equal protection under the law for all the unborn, you know, no matter what age or stage they're they're in. Right. So that's HB 2650. But, you know, all these guys, unfortunately, that sponsored HB 2650, they did flop. Now, Mm -hmm. we can't. We're not allowed to impugn motives. We can't see the heart of a person. Right. But we do know what politics is and what politicians do. Mm -hmm. They get lobbied. I mean, they're professional lobbyists that lobby a politician to vote in a particular way. And the pro-life industry, unfortunately, lobbied a lot of our sponsors that were going to sponsor a truly God-honoring bill in HB 2650. Yeah. And now they flop and they all vote for SB 1457, declaring it a big pro-life victory. Right. But it's not. It's not. Well, one, it's inconsistent, right? Because it's saying it's okay to murder healthy children. Right. Jeff says <laughs> it right here. He says abortion because of genetic abnormalities is no longer allowed. So killing the healthy children is accepted. Mm-hmm. Killing the healthy ones. So right. it's it's not okay to kill kids with Down syndrome, but it's okay to kill healthy kids. Right. That's exactly what it is. And he goes on to say, just not the children with Down syndrome. Don't worry, pro-choice friends, because, of course, this is a good bill for pro-choicers. A mother only needs to say she wants to kill her child because she wants to kill it, not because the child has genetic abnormalities. So right. she goes and sees a doctor. Well, the fetus is bringing me a lot of depression or whatever it may be. Mm-hmm. Okay, let's kill it. Right. So what is this bill ultimately? And I like how he starts out with that and his explanation here. It's irrelevant. It's right. an irrelevant bill. Mm-hmm. It's a trash bill. Right. It means nothing. It doesn't. Because all you have to do is lie right. about what you're going to do. Mm-hmm. And there you go. Right. And we were reading through the bill and uh, it actually, de- so Arizona statute 13 dash. 3603 and 4 criminalizes abortion. And if you go through the verbiage, I believe it, this actually decriminalizes it, even though those statutes, th- these bills are not upheld. Um, if you look through the actual bill, it, it decriminalizes it. Right, exactly. Which is, so in essence, 
in on paper anyways, we've taken a step backwards, right? Even though in in reality th- those bills were not being upheld anyways. So even though yeah, HB thirteen thirty six oh three was the law of the that, land. That's though. what I meant, not not bill law. Yeah, yeah so, exactly. So the problem is, so like Jeff was explaining, if Roe v. Wade, because uh, he he got interviewed by Channel Three and Channel Five mm-hmm. last time, which he did an awesome job. I wish they would actually put everything that he had to say. Mm. I think he had twelve or fifteen seconds, but what he said was good. But even if Roe v. Wade went away. Then, of course, now we have SB 1457 that would keep abortion legal right. and going, you know, whereas if 1336.03.04 wasn't uh, done away with, then we'd have something on the books that would penalize uh, abortion as, as a crime. Right. Yeah. So it's actually not only irrelevant, but it's working against what we want. And that's a total abolition of abortion. Right. It's, it's sad. You know, it's it's disheartening because these sponsors that we had were seemingly so convicted and, and i guess a politician can really um fool you mm-hmm. and again i can't read a man's heart i don't want to impute motives but you know when can we get some politicians some men and women with a backbone who mm-hmm. really stand by conviction and not just the expediency of their political office right right that's they're really looking out for their own self but, right you know and i was thinking about this as i was preparing for this today is there's always been that, and there's always going to be that. You know, when the war for independence, only 15% of the nation wanted to be free from Britain's tyranny. Right. The rest were in the mushy middle. I like, you know, somebody says it like that, the mushy middle, mm-hmm. where you just really just care about yourself. Right. You know, it's about yeah. how can I how can I get forward in life? And that's just American pragmatism, too. Mm-hmm. It's just what, what can I do to get me to where I want to be? Right. Um, philosophically, that's what it is. And it's sad because those people really don't accomplish anything um, noteworthy or things that help their neighbor or, you know, put to death and injustices. So that's a massive populace of people. But God has always risen up these sacrificial people. And in, you know, for a guy, a politician, to sponsor a bill like this and to see it actually forward and come into, come into, um, to be actualized and then enforced, it's going to, require a lot of sacrifice and i'm thinking yeah. like joseph silk in oklahoma mm-hmm. that type of a man we just need kind of cloned and duplicated around the nation in yeah. the political realm right yeah. absolutely i'm glad you explained it too though because i i think if you're new to this fight you know like like i was become you know being pro going from pro-choice to pro-life to abolitionist you kind of are like you know well well what about aren't we happy about some kids being saved right you know that's kind of the first off the cuff type of thing you think but as you look deeper into it you're saying uh no this isn't this isn't right this isn't consistent and i like what pastor jeff said you know would we be okay if this was sex trafficking yeah he says right there he says furthermore imagine putting in a bill that allows sex trafficking so as long as the victims aren't handicapped so what the bill does is it just it conceals the truth about the situation right right it changes i mean uh, it changes definition so mm-hmm. i like what he did he just exposed the reality of the situation and he goes on to say kathy Hare doesn't want abortion to be a crime with punishment for parents who have them however in this bill she wants each child child to at least have a proper bur- burial and then he i like how he brings that to light he says imagine getting a bill that allows for the jews to be gassed just as long as you give them a proper burial right right, right. so they cloak they cloak um the truth they cloak what they want to do in pro-life type of verbiage right. when it's just it's 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 wrong it's compromising it's god dishonoring it's iniquitous and in, in, inconsistent mm-hmm. yeah. yeah so i think it's just a lot of it is just uh having the light shine on what's actually going on because if your first you know um response to this is like excitement then i can understand that because you see something you're like man at at the very least their lord use this to at least get people to start thinking about the value of life and are we being consistent so i mean there's always silver lining you can always find good in every situation as far as like i hope that people look at this and realize no we can't be praising bills like this or the heartbeat bills we have to be consistent across the board or none of it makes sense yeah yeah and and i like it it's people say uh, you know uh, this type of a bill is an iniquitous decree right right it's it's something that god wouldn't be happy with Mm -hmm. because he's the one ultimately by his grace and his mercy is is going to use his people when they're faithful to him 
he's going to use something that's faithful to him to end mm-hmm. this. Not mm-hmm. something that's not faithful to him. Not right. saying it's okay to kill some kids and not others. Right. I mean, you know, Russell Hunter goes on to explain this type of situation really well when yeah. it comes to we need to be faithful to him. We need to represent him. Yeah. You know, we need to not dishonor him by supporting something that is not congruent with his will and his wishes and his character. Right. You know, that we as you know, we as Christians need to be purveyors of the truth. We're people of the truth. Right. And um, this is you know, supporting SB fourteen fifty seven would just be aiding and abetting something that is not righteous right it's not right it's not okay to kill i mean and the explanation is simple yeah it's not okay okay you kill you can kill kids in room a A, but you can't kill kids in room b and we're like yay wait a minute that's messed up and so what the politicians do and i think what they did here is they understood that there's a massive amount of people in in arizona that are Mm pro-life so they tried to placate the pro-lifers to try to get them back on their side so that they'd continue to vote for them and to continue further career. Right. Um, while, you know, creating some type of bill that would, of course, appease them. Right. And pro-lifers don't really, I mean, generally don't think critically or biblically. Mm -hmm. They're like, oh, you know, this is helping some kids, but that's just not what we're called to do. The Bible says rescue those who are being delivered to death, not rescue some of mm-hmm. those who are being delivered yeah to death. can you imagine you know like two people groups or two types of children you know being burnt in a building and you say well you know we do have the power to rescue some yeah but we're gonna re- or all of them but we're just gonna rescue some and yeah call you, it a victory you walk in with the clipboard excuse me child are you five and up or no okay Boom. yeah yeah no do you have any gen- genetic uh, abnormality Oh, you, you don't? Okay, you can go ahead and burn. Yeah. That's exactly yeah, it. Yeah, that's crazy. All right, well, thanks for explaining that because I think that, you know, like I said, a lot of our listeners may be new to this, so we want to explain why. We don't want to just, like, poo-poo something and not have an explanation, but, yeah, it was a bad bill. I'm thankful for Pastor Jeff and the opportunity that the Lord gave him to go on the news because, I mean, I have a lot of, I think, well-intentioned friends that are pro-life and they just they just don't know yet you know they're just haven't been educated yet in this area like me just you know excited about anything that seems like it might be a victory but yeah we got to be careful you know yeah and it's just thinking about things critically Mm -hmm. and not just taking some you know taking someone's word for it so it's your favorite pro-life um you know celebrity or somebody you've heard or some right. authority well i'm all, i'm gonna believe it because this authority says it right and they represent what's truly pro-life it's mm-hmm. like no 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 we need to take whatever anybody says like the good brands did in the mm-hmm. book of acts we need to say is this is this congruent with scripture mm-hmm. does this agree with god's view of the situation because I understand most people, and I think initially when God woke me up to this in 2011, I was like, I had talked to somebody and they said, are you an incrementalist or an immediatist? And I was like, well, probably an incrementalist. Right. You, know, you know, we'll just get what we can get until mm-hmm. I really thought about it and brought the scriptures to bear upon the situation and say, no, 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 we don't incrementally turn from a wickedness. Right. We are to kill it. Cut we it off. Forsake yeah. it. Mm-hmm. We are to repent now fully. God says, "Forsake your sin. Turn from it. Run from it." So, it's just uh, it's just what we have to do as Christians is think biblically and critically about. It. And and what we want to do is take people with us and win them over to an abolitionistic uh, point of view, not just hey, you're thinking wrong, and therefore you you know let me just slam you. And right. I think as abolitionists, we get we tend to do that out of zeal, maybe zeal without knowledge. And lacking compassion, we we need to again take this huge group of people that we need to use, or maybe we need to come. A better word would be come alongside of us to vote for righteous bills. Right. We need to win them to the mindset so that they would do that and not just hit them over the head with a hammer because they're in the wrong. Right. Mm-hmm. I think sometimes you know, like even doing public evangelism or going to the mills, you hear the same arguments over and over and over again. So I think that we need to be careful because sometimes we can become impatient, you know, not patient, impatient with people and oh, not totally. explain when yeah. they, they might just not know. So if you're listening to this and you're an abolitionist, I would just say, you know, take the time to be patient with people and explain like someone did for you, you know? Exactly right. So. That's good. That's so important. And I, I need to do that too, not only in this subject, but also out at the mills, you know, just, um, you know, you get out there and you're, 
you know, well, you're sitting out there for hours and you're in a place that you hate yeah. to be and you're receiving all sorts of violence and you know vitriol and hostility from people and you're like man don't let this affect the way that i talk to the moms and dads going in you know? right we have to be firm and there's the, the the tool of the rebuke but it's also i'm gonna need to I want to educate this person on what they're doing, right. biblically, what the Bible has to say, you know, with a tempered spirit, self-controlled. Scott Horde does that so well in Tennessee. Mm -hmm. I mean, one of the best. I think Steve, Stephen Smith and Augusta does that so well. As I traveled around the nation um, for a little bit of time last October, the, the uh, common denominator with these men that are seeing so many baby saved is compassion and mm. patience. Right. You know, and humility, deep humility, and the willingness to walk with a woman, you know, quote unquote, walk in the sense that they're informing her of what she's doing in a loving way. Right. So it's important. Yeah. Right. So I, my next question would be this, um, doing what you do every week, week after week, being confronted with the darkness of abortion, you know, just being out there all the time. Um, and also doing public evangelism, like we talked about and just talking to the lost, how would you, what advice could you give our listeners on, you know, why is it important to have joy and how can we, how can we remain joyful in the midst of such darkness and not let the darkness overcome us? Um, and what do you, how do you think, do you think God has a sense of humor? Like, can we have a sense of humor throughout all of this? I mean, yeah. like we said, there's a time and a place for everything, but how, this is a lot of questions, but how would you how would you respond to that? Yeah, there's a lot, a lot yeah. to think about, but yeah. and you could respond to it too, because yeah. you know. Uh, but I think, um, well, God must have a sense of humor because we do, right? You know, our sense of humor only has its foundation in Him. Mm -hmm. You know, He's a, you know, the Bible says that He laughs. Yeah, He's a God who laughs, and you know, we, you have to have that. You've got to have levity to it all, because uh, the Bible says, "Do not be overcome with evil, but overcome evil with good." So mm -hmm. in you know, I think we've talked about it before on the show, but in, you know, the abortion fight, whether it be prophetically out in front of the abortion clinics or legislatively, it's a dark, sucky thing to mm, do. It's, yeah. a, it's a difficult, crappy ministry. Um, but you have to be able to you know, get serious about it and prepare for it and be a soldier in the battle, but also um, be joyful in life. Don't yeah. let it rob you. The joy. I think, why should we be joyful? Because mm -hmm. the Bible commands us to. Right. It says rejoice. And again, I tell you, rejoice. Mm -hmm. so rejoice is an imperative. An imperative is a command. God mm -hmm. commands you to be joyful. And, you know, just think about, you know, what can make you joyful in that situation? Is this the sovereignty of God? That right. He's ultimately in control of all things, that there's nothing that escapes his gaze. There's nothing that's not a part of his ultimate will. Mm -hmm. And so that's where you can actually, in the midst of this battle, um, and the difficulties that we face, and we just talked about this bill, and you know, you feel like you go kind of one step forward and two steps back. That he's in control of all things, right? And that he is going to do as he pleases, and I can just rest in that. Yeah. And I want to live a life of joy. I want. We want to fight hard, and uh, ultimately, again, our home is not in this world, but we want to live this life. And the Bible says to enjoy all that God has given us. Right. And so for me, I think, how do I remain joyful? Is you just, you try to leave it there. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, the first couple of years of doing it, I don't think I really succeeded in it. I would come home and just be enraptured into it and, you know, bringing it home. But I think you really have to just leave it there and, you know, find joy. How do I find joy in the Lord, but also in my kids, mm -hmm. you know, just to turn off all that and just turn on, with them, you right. know, being in the present with them and picking up Phoebe and, mm -hmm. and wrestling them around and, you know, tickling them. And, you know, that's, it's just important to do that. And I think it comes with the ability to compartmentalize. Compartmentalization, especially as ministry as a pastor, is hugely important mm -hmm. because all throughout the day, and you know, we as the apology of pastors have a lot going on all the time. You know, we can go from a counseling appointment where you're rejoicing because somebody is, has freedom over a, a sex addiction or mm. a drug addiction and then you go directly into a meeting to where you have to confront somebody in their habitual sin that they're not getting out of it. so mm -hmm. so it's you have to be able to just put that in its space and not let all these things bleed into you to overwhelm you so right. compartmentalization of focus i think for me has really helped me just to be joyful and to be uplifted and you know because if you don't you're just gonna walk down like you're walking around like eeyore right and then we're not we're commanded not to do that right yeah. when it's the fruit of the spirit love joy 
joy, peace. Yeah, yeah, that is the produce of the spirit. So that is what God is working in and out of us. Yeah. And um, if the spirit of God is in us, we're going to be joyful. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I want to be like the Proverbs 31 woman who laughs without fear of the future. You know, we're, we're called to not be afraid and actually to laugh because we're not afraid because we have the Lord. And so I, that's what I aim to be. I want to find joy in every day. And I want to think on what's true and pure and lovely and honorable and, and not be overcome. I mean, if you look at the news, sometimes you're just like, oh my gosh, you know, I just want to just close off all of my uh, social oh, media, yeah. throw mm -hmm. away every TV <laughs> and go move to the mountains. Cause you see like today, I think it was, or yesterday it was like, Joe Biden says that if you're fully vaccinated, you're allowed to go outside. Hmm. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, thank you for that enlightening information per, per the norm. Yeah. Thank, yeah, totally. Thank you so much. I mean, it, it, it can, it can overtake you if you allow it to, but if you rest in the joy of the Lord, if you rest in his sovereignty, like you said, and you find all the good and the blessings that he's given you in your family and your friends and, and good food to eat and uh, getting in the word and going and fellowshipping with the saints. There's so much we can be thankful for oh, yeah, and totally. to set our minds on to rejoice and that we, we don't have to just set our minds on the negative. Totally. So. And I think you, I like what you said there, you know, she, she laughs because she's not afraid of the future. Right. Well, why is she not afraid of the future? Because she knows what is certain about the future, mm -hmm. you know, that we're going to spend an eternity. I mean, think about an eternity. We can't even fathom that because we're in a time-space continuum, you know, yeah. um, just moment by moment. But being with the Lord, free from sin, right, which is the greatest, I think the greatest joy about heaven is Christ, mm -hmm. but being free from your sin that you hate, right. you know. Um, there's this, there's just an immense amount of joy, but it, it, what it is, it's, it's focusing on things that are certain. I remember in, um, I can't remember which part of first Samuel it was, but David's family and all the family of his men at that time got taken away and kidnapped. Can you imagine that? Mm -hmm. So we're out warring, I think, you know, with the Philistines can't remember exactly what was going on in the context of that scripture, but you go home and you're, and think about you go home and Don and Liam and the kids are like stolen. Yeah. From these wicked people yeah. that are incredibly evil that who knows what they're going to do with them. Yeah. Or I go home and my babies are taken away. Yeah. And so they immediately just grieve, mm -hmm. you know, like grieving. And then, of course, they're getting mad at David. Uh, but it says David encouraged himself in the Lord. And then he eventually, you know, I, he stirred up the men to go and they rescued him. Right. But what did he encourage himself in that which is certain about mm. the Lord and about all the his past and how the Lord had blessed him and had been with him. But what we have to do is if we're going to be joyful and encouraged, mm -hmm. we have to put our feet solidly in a solid place. And that's the certainty of the scriptures. That's why you have to limit like Fox and CNN. I mean, look at CNN. It's just come out that they just fabricate stories. Yeah. They do it. I mean, it's all negative and it's all you know, dire because they have a political agenda, I think a, a power grab agenda, but you don't know. And even Fox and how liberal that Fox yeah. has become. Yeah. So you get on there and you're like, what stories have they fabricated and what stories have they not? Mm -hmm. And so many people run off that type of fuel in their life. And right. that's just not, that's not what the Christian is commanded to do. There's no right. joy in that. There's no stability. There's no longevity. There's no power in that. You know, it's got to be Joy has to spring out of the certainty of not what we know to be true about God. That's yeah. right. Yeah. I was just going to say, how can we have longevity if we are overcome with evil? We won't. We'll burn out. We'll go hide in a cave. There's no way if you're not thinking on God's promises that you'd be able to stand the test of time doing this oh, type totally. of ministry. Yeah. Being faithful to Christ. And mm -hmm. uh, you see what it does. I mean, you go out there and what people do, you know, as we travel to Kauai and you know, seeing people wear triple mask layers with a, like a plexiglass glass screen hmm. in front of them and a, like a big old suit of armor on top, <laughs> not the suit of armor, <laughs> but double, triple mask with yeah. the plate. And you're like, and then they, you go near them and they just want to get away from you as yeah, soon as you, possible. You so had a, a fear. You, you had know? a lady confront you guys, right? Yeah, so that was fun. What happened? <laughs> that sucks so hard. So it's late at night, you know, we take the red eye. You have we'll, seven kids. Seven kids. Four, so the kids or are three of them that are under four years old, four right. and under. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Macy, Phoebe, and Titus. Mm -hmm. And so it's hard, you know, it was just 
it was a blessing going, you know, but it was tough just traveling. Right. You know, with Phoebe on the way over there, she was just upset and trying to calm her down. Titus was, and they, she went to sleep for like 15 minutes oh, and seven man. hours. It was okay. Um, but you take the red eye, so it's 8.30 at night. The, the plane takes off at 10.30. And then I guess we had, um, you know, I was sitting inside of the Kauai terminal at the gate and people were looking at me because I didn't have my mask. Actually, I did have my mask. I was just, it was on my ear and mm-hmm. I would take it off. I even put a drink in my hand because mm-hmm. you're allowed to not wear a mask if you're drinking. And so mm-hmm. I got these just mean kind of uh, stare downs. And then we get up and we go with our group and uh, I hear something behind me and this lady's like, hey, your son's not, doesn't have his, his mask over his nose. And I just looked at her and like blinked like twice and just turned like mm-hmm. ignored her uh-huh. and then she goes well who was it hmm? who was it jude or preston i think it was both of them oh yeah and mm-hmm. those guys are brawlers so they couldn't <laughs> they were saying stuff and like uh-huh. looking at her and we're like whoa you're tripping you know what are you doing you know so they're not quick to be quiet you know <laughs> and so they're saying that and that's kind of ticking her off mm-hmm. and then um she's like oh you're not gonna wear your your mask that way well then how about I just get you kicked off the plane? Mm-hmm. And so, oh my gosh, doesn't this woman understand, you know, that a lot of money, it takes a lot of money to switch flights. And mm-hmm. what if we got kicked out of the plane? Yeah. And, you know, what if we had to go stay up in a hotel with seven small different children people and, and small children yeah. crying? And, yeah. You know, she just didn't think about the ramifications of doing that to a person. Yeah. Over a, a situation that's 99.999% survivable. All right. They just don't get it. Yeah. And so I was like seeing red. And then, of course, I wanted to just you know, speak my piece and <laughs> really confront her and her husband. But I didn't, I zipped my lip. I'm like, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna fight right now because I have to get on this plane and get home. Right. You know, Yeah. the cost of fighting, I don't think it was too much for what I would have gained mm. in that, in that battle with her, you know. Thank you, Lord. Yeah. So we get on the plane and, mm. and, um, you know, I think her, actually her husband, walk by and it's like because i let them go i Mm -hmm. just i don't want to have anything to do with you and he said thank you and i just you know i was mad for about four hours (laughs) thinking of like because when they somebody threatens your kids you know i know you get into rage mode and you're like man you're threatening my kids to kick them off you're speaking this way towards my children so god gave me the ability in that moment just to shut up and you know think things through but it took me a while just to calm down but hey i don't know i'm kind of torn because you're you go through that and you're like i don't want to fly yeah i just don't want to fly this is crazy this is stupid but then you're like no i went there to bless a church i mm-hmm. went there to promote the gospel you know i can do this to stay in the field evangelistically right um yeah, it's just a, I don't know if people would disagree with that. And they think wearing the mask is aiding and abetting a lie. And, mm. and I can understand where they're coming from. Um, it's just complicated. I just knew in that moment I had to shut up and uh, um, just keep my mouth zipped. Yeah, because otherwise you wouldn't have been able to come home. The likelihood of you getting kicked off the plane is high. Yeah, and who knows what they would have done with us. Right. You know, what Kauai would have done or, you know, now we're who knows uh, sometimes you do have to make that sacrifice to do the right yeah. thing i mean i've but, had to to go to go get groceries for my kids like i now it's not that way but before it's like okay i had to wear a mask because they were saying that i couldn't come in and i was like really pregnant and i'm like i'm not gonna fight them i'm gonna go and get my food and get out this was earlier on sure. in 2020 yeah. and don did most of the shopping for us while it's coronavirus and I was hugely pregnant because he's like I don't want you to have to go in there with the mask and pregnant and you know he had to wear a mask because Costco's super super duper strict about it like mm-hmm. oh totally even the other yeah. day I just went in just to go I had to get contact so I was li- literally in there for 15 seconds mm-hmm. and a lady yelled at me and I'm like sure you know yeah, yeah that's all I mean the mask situation is just not a cut and dry you yeah know, I've listened to a lot of people and you know a lot of people say oh you're aiding and abetting and like and I understand where they're coming from and I think there's some truth to that or right. you know you know really really getting on Christians for wearing masks mm-hmm. um but then you're like okay let's say a guy comes up to me and says dude I you know, if I don't wear my mask, I'm not going to be able to work. Right. Well, he doesn't wear his mask. He's not going to be able to work to provide for his family. Right. Who's his, what's your primary ministry as a man? Right. It's your, your family. family. Mm-hmm. So he's putting his family before that situation, which I think is a good call. Yeah. But we don't want to uh, placate. We don't want to compromise. We don't want to, we have to resist. What does Knox say? 
obedience to God is the resistance of tyrants. Mm-hmm. We have to do that. But uh, you also understand, too, throughout history as Christians, the French Huguenots, the, the Scottish Covenanters, all throughout history, they picked their battles. Right. They didn't die on every hill in every situation. They did pick their battles. They were compliant to the government as mm-hmm. much as they could be Right. Um, until it crossed the line, of course, where the government was trying to come in and dictate their worship or you know, doing something. Uh, telling them to do something that God forbids or commanding them not to do something that God um, forbids. Right. If I said that right. I think you did. Yeah, I don't know. I heard it right. Anyways. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, yeah. So the, it was just getting to the point that uh, we do have to be compliant as far as we could. We had, there's, yeah. you know, you see it all the time. They would run from the Huguenots. They would hide, you know, they would do what they had. You know, they would do that. They would do that. Um, and I think that didn't make sense. They would run from the uh, the government, but they would also comply as much as they could. That's right. What I'm trying to say. Yeah, yeah, I think there's a lot of middle ground too. Of like, so the lady that that yelled at me at Costco, I I had the mask. I'm like, I really, if I don't have my contacts, I can't see. <laughs> so I have glasses too, but I needed my contacts. But I was like, hey, why are you guys doing this when our local uh, authorities are not even saying like our governor? lifted the mandate there is no mass mandate in here and costco continues to push it even though our local authorities are saying you don't have to do it and she's like you know got at first got an attitude and was like well it's because costco is a privately owned business and you guys don't have to wear it seven hours a day like i do and i'm like well i don't want you to have to wear it either and then she immediately was like oh you know kind of disarmed because i was being kind to her about it and just Mm -hmm. kind of challenging her i was like hey somebody's got to say something or it's just going to continue on so i'm praying that costco stops doing this because it's it doesn't make sense so and ultimately they do it because of um you know they're worried about their customers they're they're worried about their bottom line yeah so i think that you know you go into i just love going into a store i went into a barbecue place with dad today Mm -hmm. to have lunch and they were cool with it yeah But then, you know, like in Texas, the governor's like, stop it. You know, Governor Abbott Mm -hmm. is like, don't do it. We're done. Let's get back to normal. And then people continue to do it. Yeah. Um, And I think you find that, you know, you go into cities that are much more liberally dominated. Mm -hmm. It's much tougher. Like even around here, Mm -hmm. I like, I don't even want to go into stores in Scottsdale or even Tempe. Right. You know, the more liberally, the, the, the populace, the populace is more liberally minded. These people are. Just, they just, they really love masks, mask mandates, vaccines, and telling other people what to do. Yeah, it's like, mm, mm. <laughs> so it's kind of nice living over in the ghetto, even though I get shot at, you know, because uh, there's just more freedom. Yeah. In the ghetto, so well, I'd rather live with the bullets coming at me than the liberals. <laughs> <laughs> Sheesh. <laughs> It's just the truth. You know? Yeah, it's just crazy. Well, I think that that's probably a good place to stop. You know, I mean, unless there's anything else you want to say, I just want to encourage ourselves and our listeners to, you know, be joyful that we have so much to be joyful about. And I know a lot of you are very heavily involved in abortion mill ministry and public evan- evangelism, bringing the gospel to the cults and, you know, just have the joy of your salvation on your lips you know hey i got a really bad joke do you want to hear it it's yeah, super it. corny i actually have two what do nosy nachos do they get hull up in your business <laughs> 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 okay i got one more um what, what what was it oh why do ducks have feathers to cover up their butt quacks <laughs> <laughs> That's yeah, a good one. That's I'm a fired. Mom jokes. I'm fired. Yeah. Yeah. No, there was another. There was a dad joke one. It was like, when does a bad, when does a dad start doing da- dad jokes or something like that? And it said, when it becomes apparent. <laughs> <laughs> I can't even <laughs> deliver the jokes. No, no, you're right. I like. Yeah. I'm, I'm glad you chose. You did a really good job leading this too. Mm. Um, mm. I'm glad you chose this topic because it it just really is important. You got to be joyful. You got to be happy. You mm-hmm. know you. 
and especially as a you know as a minister and and, and you pastors out there we don't want to do do the work that god has given us with just like this begrudging spirit mm-hmm. like just you know the duty is a part of it but we want to be joyfulness we want to have those you know the the, the perspective that we're victorious mm-hmm. in christ and right. he is making all things new that he's putting that his is, enemies and ours under his yeah fleet, you know so, so those those truths the truth is what leads to joy really right. fixing on that fueling yourself feeding yourself with the truth has to lead to joy if you're not there's no joy there right but i think one of the most joyful guys is cal zastro i was gonna bring him up he's yeah. the the most joyful man i've ever met yeah yeah he is you just go out and talk to him revival and glory and yeah. even in, and he goes to the mill constantly he's for been decades. in the battle for decades yeah. but i don't think i've ever seen him not be smiling right like even when he's talking he's smiling the yeah. whole time mm-hmm. because he's just so filled with the joy of the lord because of his knowledge of jesus and so yeah yeah if you could if you could ever be around that guy you need to rub up against him a little bit oh, totally. you can't go away from him not being encouraged yeah. totally mm-hmm. yeah all right guys well thank you for spending your time with us and um we got some fun stuff ahead i think we have a flat earther hopefully in the works well yeah so two weeks we'll be having about a two-hour debate with mark okay mm-hmm. uh you mm-hmm. azure mm-hmm. what's his name oj oj uh-huh. sorry mark yeah, yeah. mark oj uh-huh. we're excited about that uh we really want to focus uh, the end of the year on equipping the church in presuppositional apologetics mm-hmm. and just you know biblical defense of the faith so we've got him coming the guy that um debated jeff wants to debate again quentin silva oh great and uh, we've got a lot of flat earthers that want to come on yeah so really thinking about and preparing myself for the flat earth type Mm -hmm. of because when you get into that you there's no going back yeah that's like kind of a pandora's box that you can't close you just keep going round and around and around yeah (laughs) (laughs) i'm just gonna do round puns the whole time (laughs) do it um yeah so that's on the horizon just really preparing um we're preparing ourselves mm-hmm. for that mm-hmm. uh, it's gonna be a flat out good time <laughs> <laughs> well we love you guys um hit that like and subscribe button here at apologia studios go to our um podcast or whatever you listen to your podcast give us a rating and a review and go to our facebook and instagram because it really helps us get the word out and we love and appreciate you guys and remember god sits in the heavens and he laughs so laugh We love you. Bye. See you guys. (laughs)